They also compare it to Visa, a centralized system, and their traditional rails that we use right now on the internet. It is a thousand times more efficient per transaction than Visa. So when you're talking about three orders of magnitude more efficient, when you're that much more efficient, a thousand times more efficient than the traditional rails, you know, you can do amazing things. At goldsilver.com, we have a price match guarantee, free shipping, global storage options, and phenomenal customer service. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your bullion dealer. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to cover my best non-precious metals investment ever. And with me today, I've got Brandon, who is a cryptocurrency expert. Brandon, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fantastic, Mike, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, because, you know, uh, I've been buried, uh, you know, just up, up over my eyeballs in writing my latest book, The Great Gold and Silver Rush for the 21st Century. And since uh, acquiring a small stake in, in uh, Hashgraph uh, right near the beginning, I haven't had time to really pay any attention to it. And man, has it done some amazing things. So uh, give us an outline of who you are, what you do, and your involvement in the crypto space. Sure. So my name is Brandon. I actually had a 20 year career in another industry and I became so fascinated with DLT and cryptocurrency. So DLT is kind of like blockchain, but it's it's more broad and covers more things. And more specifically, I think your technology, right? That's what yes. Yeah, yes, right. exactly, exactly. It's just a broader term to talk about pretty much blockchain. But um, so I became really fascinated with it and I wanted to build in the space. So I left that long and fairly good career to, to start building. So I became an entrepreneur and I also work for a company called the HBAR Foundation, which was tasked with building out the ecosystem within uh, Hedera. And I do things like community engagement, and I do Twitter spaces every week, and I do a show every Friday to get everybody up to speed of all the things that are being built within the Hedera ecosystem. So that's where I am now. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, you just wanted to start out with something a little bit more general and then uh, focus in on Hedera Hashgraph later, right? Sure, sure. So I think the first thing I'd like to talk about is why people talk about cryptocurrency and crypto DLT platforms as a once in a multi-generational uh, opportunity. And the reason I think that's true is because number one, it's a technological revolution. And we've seen throughout history, we've had many technological revolutions going back to, you know, canals and the railroad and automobiles, computers, the internet. And it's on par with a technical te technological revolution like that. Um, but there's another aspect to it. You're obviously a uh, monetary history buff, right? And we've seen with those technological revolutions, people can get ahead of, ahead of themselves. They can allocate a lot of capital, a lot of time. Another place in monetary history we've seen that is in gold rushes. Right. You'd have uh, a school teacher from Ohio decide he's going to go to the Klondike and prospect for gold because at the time, not only gold at the time was gold money like it is now, but it, it was also the currency at the time. So people would get ahead of themselves and get really excited. Well, cryptocurrency and DLT platforms are also a means to transfer value over the internet. So they can be currencies and they can also transfer a lot of other things that, that we might talk about a little bit later on. So it's the combination of that technological revolution with a digital gold rush that makes it that once in a multi-generational uh, opportunity for us all. So it's been really excited to get, get into the weeds on this and Hedera's really building some pretty impressive things. Yeah, you know, uh, recently, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, sort of chimed in on what he calls craptos. Instead, <laughs> he doesn't understand them. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that, you know, this is a different generation. Um, in, uh, in the episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money, which was Bitcoin to Hashgraph, mm -hmm. uh, I referred to, uh, you know, the dinosaurs watching this asteroid coming in. <laughs> And not realizing what it's going to do. And Charlie Munger has just sort of proven himself a dinosaur. Uh, he doesn't understand that this is not just some token that you buy, that, it, that this has immense functionality. And I believe that, uh, that Hashgraph, I'm, I'm 
not absolutely certain, but from everything that I know, it's the fairest, the fastest, the most energy efficient, the, the safest, the most versatile, uh, and the, the most scalable. And uh, it's the, isn't it the only one that's like FTC and SEC compliant? They they have certainly tried from the beginning to be as compliant as possible yeah. in the gray regulatory area that there is. But like you said, you know, Charlie needs to to pay attention to a lot more more things. Like you said, Hedera has there's a lot of things we use to judge these different DLTs because not only do we have to participate in this space, but we have to figure out which one's going to do well. And there's a lot of things we look at. Like you said, you know, there's there's speed of finality, there's throughput, how many transactions per second it can do. There's governance, which is really important. The decentralization, the team behind it, of course, the security. You've covered in the past how Hedera is ABFT, which is the gold standard of security. But I think you touched on one of the most important things. You have to have all those things to have a good foundation but the efficiency is is really important um and university college london did a study a couple years ago and found out that hedera was the most efficient and when we hear efficiency a lot of times we think of environmental efficiency which this efficiency has allowed hedera to be the home of a lot of environmental use cases but when we hear that efficiency i think we have to think about dollars and cents it's the cheapest platform that's out there and if you look at it, I'll, I'll send an infographic so everybody can see what we're looking at. And it compares Hedera to a lot of the other DLTs that are out there. But the thing that's really interesting is they also compare it to Visa, a centralized system, and their traditional rails that we use right now on the internet. It is a thousand times more efficient per transaction than Visa. So when you're talking about three orders of magnitude more efficient, that's really all you ha should have to say to, um, to Charlie Munger of what the justification for D DLT, for cryptocurrency, and for Hedera, when you're that much more efficient, a thousand times more efficient than the traditional rails, you know, you can do amazing things. And, and we'll get into some of those things as we go forward. But, you know, it's it's not even the difference between walking and driving or walking and a jet, right? That's what five knots compared to 500 knots. This is like a, a turtle compared to a jet airliner. You know, it's that kind of improvement over what we're using right now. Yeah, uh, a lot of people don't understand also that there is more that a DLT can do than just uh, transmit value over space and time. Sure. Uh, you know, it, within a, a second or a couple of seconds, you can uh, transact and transfer value to the other side of the planet at almost no cost. What's the cost per transaction on Hedera? It depends on what you're using, but it can be as low as if you're using HCS, it can be as low as one one hundredth of a penny. One one hundredth of a penny uh, without any intermediary, but you can do things like uh, escrow, but it can record almost any event. So is there a possibility, for instance, of running the traffic grid, water systems, power, uh, power generation systems of uh, programs working on distributed ledger technology so that it's, uh, it's all over the place, so that if one point of failure happens, it doesn't affect the system. Uh, what are the applications beyond a payment system? Sure. Well, I mean, payment system is is where it starts. And I'm actually going to start with that, but we will get into all those other things. We'll start with micropayments, which um, really are only possible with a hyper-efficient DLT like Hedera. And right now, our premier micropayments solution is a company called Drop. They are some great guys, and I did some interviews with them. And right now, they are integrated into Shopify and WordPress. So, you know, anybody that's a retailer on Shopify can leverage them. I'm really interested to see what happens with WordPress, though, because, you know, anybody can now use these tools. And just to give you some, some context around why it's important for micropayments is somebody gave me some pushback and said, actually, PayPal is better for micropayments. So I did some research. I contacted the drop team and we got some numbers together and number one, because PayPal has overhead, they only can go so cheap as far as their their payments and the cheapest they can have is one dollar that's their limit they can only go down that low and what's more is we'll say there's a, a low value transaction that's being made uh, on the internet we'll say it's for an article or a video or something along those lines well right now if you do did that with 
PayPal at $1, 51 cents is going to PayPal. Only 49 cents is going to the producer of that content. When it comes to uh, Drop, Drop does that with a 5% fee across the board. So at that $1 payment, you're only paying 5 cents to Drop and you get 95 cents. And especially if you're giving a tip, you know, that could be the difference of deciding to give that tip or not. Because if you know that 50% is going to um, somebody uh, going to PayPal and not where you intend it, you might not give it. But if you know, know 95% of it is going where you want, you might be that much more willing. But it really gets interesting once we get lower than that. You know, once we get down to 20 cents, where 19 cents, it's not even possible with PayPal, but 19 cents is going where you want it compared to one cent. And they can go all the way down to a one cent uh, transaction. You know, and this can also, we can get into this a little bit that, you know, the, the current models for uh, small value transaction on the internet. And by small value, I don't mean that uh, what those items are, are low value they just have a low market price on the internet we're talking about you know single articles or videos or things like that and there's two ways you can monetize that on the internet one way is to use a subscription model and that works very well for places like netflix and disney plus and places like that that have tons of content that they can give but a lot of traditional publishers have trouble with it right so places like uh, the new york times they try to use the subscription model and it's difficult for them and that but at least that allows you to remain the uh, customer, right? The other way we can monetize those low value transactions is through an ad based model. And that's where you become the product, not the, the customer, you know, where they show a bunch of ads and the advertisers, and we know all the issues that can come from that. With these micropayments, um, you can actually become the customer again, which is really exciting. Uh, it solves a, all kinds of problems. And then like you were saying, it opens up all kinds of other things, like internet of things. Maybe it's not a consumer and a producer that's, that's uh, using those micropayments, but it is actually two machines that are talking back and forth that are using those micropayments. Or like you said, smart cities, you're using it for paying for parts parking or something along those lines. It really has tremendous potential. Uh, but like you said, it can be used all, for all kinds of other things. We can talk about supply chain tracking, about DeFi and TradFi uh, and all that kind of fun stuff, but wherever you'd like to take it. DeFi and TradFi. Now, I haven't heard of TradFi, but mm -hmm. uh, DeFi is d distributed finance, right? And that's TradFi. Sure. So, uh, Decentralized finance, DeFi is, is kind of a proof of concept phase right now, but it's going to go into TradFi. And TradFi is just traditional finance. But how can we use some of the tools that are being created by platforms like Hedera in those traditional financial worlds? So to start out, we'll talk about DeFi. Right now, there are, of course, there's plenty of tokens out there, and you can take those tokens and trade them using smart contracts built on Hedera back and forth. And it completely eliminates the need for an intermediary. Well, the intermediaries out there are, you know, all those exchanges. Right now on Hedera, we have built um, something called the Digital Commodities Exchange. It's the first traditional financial exchange that I know of on any DLT. And back in August, they actually um, started to use Hedera just for adding trust to their platform as a first step. Uh, but I interviewed them not long ago, and they are going to be moving to a full DeFi model where they tokenize the commodity these contracts and then they use the smart contracts to transfer uh, ownership back and forth between the different parties. This is a huge step forward and a huge proof of concept for everybody else that's looking in the space. So of course you're aware of BlackRock out there, right? A huge yes, asset. First, first sure, can, go ahead. can you explain smart contracts to the audience? Just sure. remember that uh, a lot of us are very traditional uh, investors uh, like Precious metals is about as basic as you can get. Mm -hmm. That's like all the, <laughs> that goes into, you know, BC, precious metals. And we're talking about the future here with, uh, with cryptos and distributed ledgers. So uh, uh, define what you're talking about here. Sure, absolutely. We'll get into smart contracts, but I, I am a traditional investor as well. I do invest in gold and silver as well. That's what actually got me into this alternative asset space. I've been following you since all the way back in 2006, but that's a great point. Sometimes wow. I- 
I go, I know I've been around for a while, um, but I do go down these rabbit holes and I need to remember to uh, explain these things. So another great technological leap that um, these DLT crypto platforms allow is the programming, the programming of asset transfers. And that's what um, smart contracts are. You can build into it a contract that says, when I want to trade this asset for this asset, that's all handled through the smart contract. So mm -hmm. it makes things a lot easier. And that's what can get rid of the intermediaries. It, it's oh. really not. Go so ahead. basically, like if you were going to buy a house for a million dollars and you didn't want to use the banking system, you can program the million dollars, the actual dollars to uh, be an escrow contract, for instance, where a third party, they, they're, uh, you've made your payment as the buyer, the seller has to deliver the product. And when a third party says, yes, the seller did deliver the product, the value is released to the, uh, to, to the seller, right? This exactly. Is so that happens contract. simultaneously, right? Yes, the currency Excel itself is programmable to do these things and a whole lot more than that. Exactly. You, you, you hit the nail on the head. You explained it okay. better than I could have. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, so yeah. So getting back to it now that we uh, understood that. So Larry Fink, he's the CEO of BlackRock, this huge asset manager, I think between 10 and 15 trillion dollars worth of assets under management. He said that the future of TradFi, of financial markets and securities, is tokenization. And not only did he say it was tokenization, but tokenization on public networks. So we're talking about platforms like Hedera and Ethereum and things like that. So if he believes that's going to happen, where are these large exchanges like the CME or the FTSE or the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange? Where are they going to look? They're going to look at proof of concepts like even though they're a functioning exchange, they're going to look at things like Digital Commodities Exchange as a proof of concept. Hey, how did they do this? And even though they might be taking market share, some of these other guys might say, hey, this might be an acquisition target or we should do it like them. Uh, Hedera, I know you've covered the Hedera Governing Council in the past, but Hedera thought that governance was really important. And Hedera has these large blue chip companies that are in charge of uh, taking care of the governance of the network. We're talking about IBM and Google and Boeing and Nomura and LG, ServiceNow, Ubisoft, and on down the line. There's 28. They're going to be going to uh, 39. But I bring that up because we had a recent um, addition called Aberdeen. They have a half a trillion dollars worth of assets under management. Now, that's not as big as BlackRock, but certainly pretty impressive in its own right. They're going to start to tokenize their assets on Hedera this year. They just bought an exchange similar to Digital Commodities Exchange that has been regulated in the UK, uh, and they're going to use this to start to tokenize their funds, and they have plans on tokenizing their entire half a trillion dollars worth of assets under management. So again, when all these other big exchanges and intermediaries look at how they are going to tokenize their funds and leverage these smart contracts, these are the things that they're going to look at for how do we do this? Excellent. Uh, you know, with the programmability, uh, this is actually one of the downsides for central bank digital currencies that people are worried about is mm -hmm. the programmability and you know, China is already in stages of testing uh, this with the public, but mm -hmm. being able to control people by making the currency only spendable, for instance, within a five mile radius of your house or that you cannot buy uh, plane, train, bus uh, tickets or, or take an Uber or a cab or that you can't uh, pay for a hotel with that currency. And, and so there there is a um, big brother aspect to the programmability uh this is why i love the public ledger space uh versus uh relying solely you know charlie munger said that the best thing that ever happened to mankind was national currencies at least he called them currencies because they're definitely not money uh but uh uh he is so wrong <laughs> If we had used money the whole time, it doesn't leak value and steal value and transfer mm -hmm. away to the government and so on. Now, uh, a super efficient uh, um, thing that where a certain number of tokens exist and it's not just magically coming into existence all the time, 
that's going to store value. The, these these uh, new things, it's my hope that they do become money one day. Right now, they are currencies, mm -hmm. currencies but I, do, I really hope that they become money one day, that we have this uh, very, very fast, efficient uh, way of transmitting value without anybody running the game, basically, and being able to dilute the currency supply and steal value from the holders of the currency. Fantastic points, Mike. And one of the things that you need to know about the digital yuan that you talked about is that's a private network. Now, all these networks, Hedera, anybody can build on Hedera. So if a central bank wanted to build a digital currency on Hedera, uh, that's certainly possible. But it's a couple things that that is positive, not not, not the CBDC. I'm not going to say that that's positive, but anybody that's building on Hedera is going to end up being a positive. Number one, because it's transparent, where the Chinese digital currency, you can't see what's going on behind the scenes. With Hedera, if they build a CBDC on us, everything would be transparent. Everybody would be able to see exactly what's happening. So that's a benefit. But the other big benefit that I see is that is giving more credence to an alternative in HBAR. Right. So if you're building things on Hedera and doing transactions on Hedera, that's giving um, revenue to the Hedera network, which is, allows us to continue to build out the Hedera ecosystem. It allows us to incentivize nodes. It allows us to incentivize token holders to build out that ecosystem. And I'm a big proponent in choice in money. You know, I want right. people to uh, use gold and silver if they want to use gold and silver. I want them to be able to use um, cryptocurrency if they want to use cryptocurrency at HBAR if they want to use HBAR. And that will, in a lot of cases, keep the government in check. If people have an alternative, that's going to be probably the best way. That's what gold does, right? When you have the ability to use gold as your medium of exchange, that puts pressure to keep the central bank doing things in the right way. This is yeah. the same way. So if they use Hedera to build their CBDC, that gives more power to one of our, one of our alternatives in the HBAR. Okay, for our audience, uh, you need to define the difference between Hedera, Hashgraph, mm -hmm. and HBAR. I think I think that's probably a good idea. Once again, Mike, I'm I'm going down these rabbit holes, and and I need to make sure that I explain these things. So, Hashgraph is the underlying algorithm that was developed by uh, one of the founders of Hedera, Dr. Lehman Baird. Um, so that's kind of like the blockchain behind Bitcoin. Okay, Hedera is the network. Okay, Hedera is the public network they, they built around DLT. Now, all kinds of platforms use blockchain like Ethereum, like a lot of other networks, but Hedera is the only one that uses Hashgraph, this really special uh, algorithm that's built that's under it. Um, HBAR is the digital currency, the native currency of Hedera. Excellent. And so it's uh, you just said native, and this is a good thing to explain to people too, because there are all these cryptocurrencies out there, but there mm -hmm. aren't that many native platforms by comparison. Sure. And HBAR is one of them. There are lots of cryptocurrencies that uh, run on other platforms. They'll run on top of Ethereum or sure. on top of Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, so this is one of the, yeah, <laughs> It's like the difference between a brand of car and a model in the brand of car. You're uh, making, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're making a fantastic point. So uh, Ethereum has literally thousands of tokens that have built on top of it. Hedera has hundreds of tokens that have built been built on top of it. And these can be stable coins like USDC or Tether. These can be uh, tokens that are used for all kinds of different things. They could be representing other things, securities. And Toco is a platform on Hedera that does that. They tokenize securities. Uh, but like you said, there can be all kinds of uh, these tokens that are built on top of other networks networks, but each one of these networks that are layer ones or layer zeros, they have a native cryptocurrency. So Ethereum is the, the native cryptocurrency of that ecosystem. Hedera, HBAR, is the native cryptocurrency of, um, of Hedera, and it's used for paying all the fees. So the fees on Hedera for different API calls are all paid in HBAR, but they're priced in dollars. Um, so when we're talking about all these transactions going back and forth, that's building up revenue for the Hedera network for, again, to, to do mainly three things, continue to build out the network, to pay the incentivize uh, nodes and to incentivize token holders. 
Hedera is is the most versatile. Ethereum is similar as, in, as far as versatility, but you have all those things that make it still beneficial to, to build on Hedera. The speed f to finality, that throughput, that governance, the team behind it, the super efficient, those kind of things make, even though Ethereum can do all the same things, they can't do them as well, in my opinion. Yeah. So, you know, you had uh, a bunch of information that you wanted to show us, and I've sort of turned this into an interview by just asking you question after question. <laughs> Uh, but go ahead and just uh, uh, give us some of the information that you had uh, play, you know, prepared for this video. Sure. Well, I mean, we've covered, uh, you know, I wanted to cover some of the use cases that were built on top of it. And we've already gone through micropayments fairly well. We've gone through DeFi and TradFi. Uh, but I did have a couple other things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, supply chain tracking is a big one on Hedera. And they mainly use the Hedera consensus service. You can think of the Hedera consensus service as like an online notary or a, an online data logging service. So it's perfect for tracking these items as they go through their supply chain. So a great example of this is Avery Dennison. Um, Avery Dennison has come out with something called AtMyO, and it tracks literally billions of objects through their raw materials, through creating the finished products, all the way to the consumer. And right now they're using it a, a lot for actually tracking the amount of carbon that's being used through that process. But just to show you the, the scale at which some of these things can, can be cre uh, created, they're processing right now between four and 700 transactions per second consistently on the Hedera network. Now that's only at one one hundredth of a cent as far as revenue for Hedera. But when you have that kind of volume, it starts to add up into real money. And even though we've known about this use case that it was supposed to come for going back, I think to 2021 was when we first heard about at, at Mayo. It just now went live on the Hedera network. So a lot of these enterprise use cases that are being built on Hedera, they take a long time to actually come to fr fruition and come to market. Another good supply chain uh, use case that I really like, we just learned about, and it's called F Fresh Supply Company. So they initially were using a solution by MasterCard called MasterCard Provenance. Of course, very it sounds very similar to the things that Hedera does, tracking that data through through the supply chain. But they also wrapped payments up inside of it. So MasterCard did a great job with that, but it was a private network. So they realized that it probably doesn't add that much trust. And it's also not their core business, probably difficult for them to run a private blockchain like that. So they've sunset that process. But Fresh Supply Co., which was the largest user of that uh, platform, they saw a lot of value in it. So they want to continue to do it. And we talked to David recently, and they're going to shift everything over to Hedera. And not only the tracking through the supply chain, but also the payments. We don't know all the details around this, but I'm really fascinated to see what comes out from that. Uh, the last thing is, is kind of a fun one, but because Hedera is super efficient, the gaming space is really starting to pick up on Hedera. And we have so many really good uh, gaming game company builders that are, are building in the space. We have uh, Astronova and we have uh, Not a Slime World, which is a mobile game. We have um, Earthlings. But the flagship one that I'm really excited about is Lithos. Lithos is a triple A gaming studio. And what that means is they produce games with like $100 million budgets. So really high production games. And their first game is going to be Ashfall. They've announced that they're going to build Ashfall, but it takes a couple years actually to come to fruition. But to explain how good the team is behind this, they're ex Sony PlayStation, and they were the driving force behind games like Last of Us, which has become an HBO series, and Uncharted. It became a blockbuster with Mark Wahlberg and Tom Holland, and they're going to be using it for in-game assets, for you know tracking the, the scores of the games and things like that. They're moving into Web3. They want to move into Web3. They, they know that that is the future for gaming, but a lot of the Web2 gamers aren't really re ready for that. So they're going through the process of bringing them along and they're doing just a really good job of making it entertaining as they're building up their game. They're developing shows and things like that that have millions of views. They have comic books and things like that that they've created NFTs, non-fungible tokens. These are tokens that are built on the Hedera network that aren't like any other token, fungible tokens, something that, that you're very familiar with. But like we've talked about through this entire thing, 
Hedera is very versatile and there's so many things that are being built. So it's really exciting to watch. Right. So for uh, some of our viewers that, again, that aren't techies, explain the difference between Web 2 and Web 3. Web 3. Sure. So Web 2 was what, what you're used to with things like Google and with Facebook. And Web 1 was the initial just websites. And then we went into all the amazing things that we've come out since we've gotten through mobile. Web 3 is leveraging these DLT, these crypto platform to enhance and bring those efficiencies to Web 2 and just take it to the next stage. Excellent. Excellent. So what else have you got for us? That I, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to to cover all the the great things that are being built in the space and give your audience an update. Well, you know, I thank you very much because uh, yeah, uh, it was it's been quite a while since I interviewed Mance, uh, and uh, I just really needed to catch up on this. And I, I'm I'm really glad we were able to bring the audience up to speed. Now, when um, Hedera Hashgraph first got listed when they came out with their token, the H bar, and it got listed on coin market cap. It was like number 1200 or something like that. And, uh, you know, for the, there, there are people that make comments and stuff on these videos, uh, because right now, you know, recently, uh, Hashgraph was down as low as, uh, three cents or three point something cents. And it had been up at 55 cents. Uh, and so people were sort of taking pokes at me for, for uh, you know, being invested in Hashgraph. But what I see is that uh, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of uh, different tokens out there. And 99 point something of them are going to be gone in 10 years. And I know that Hedera Hashgraph and HBAR are going to be among the few that survive and thrive uh there and that is you know i'm a long-term investor i'm not a trader and so that is what i'm looking for is uh, one that is still there and with all of the advantages the only advantage that bitcoin has over hedera hashgraph or hbar is that it was first mover that is it everything else that can be done by a cryptocurrency is done better with uh, by a distributed ledger, I should say. The, the cryptocurrency part is only one small aspect of what the distributed ledger can do. So I thank you so much for being here and updating us on all of this and explaining to people what it is, because uh, this is a video that Charlie Munger should watch. <laughs> I would, I would agree. There, there's no question about that. I, I, I will put on a different hat. You know, I was talking about how I do some contract work for the H Bar Foundation, but none of my opinions that I'm, I'm about to say have anything to do with the H Bar Foundation. They are just my own personal opinions. I started out as an H Bar investor and just got more and more um, captured by the potential of the network. You know, I'm building uh, my own application in the space, but I think what we really need to look at when it comes to the H Bar is these things that. That are being built as we watch and these different use cases come online why we get excited about tps is because of the revenue that it generates for the network and i've already explained how that works and what it's used for it's used for building out the network uh, incentivizing uh, nodes and token holders that is the same way that you might judge a company. And I think in the future, we're going to do the same thing with these digital platforms, that you're going to look at what's being built, how much revenue is being produced, and what is that going to do for the holder of these assets. And when you look at Hedera, you don't have to pay attention to the price. The price is going to be super volatile, influenced by all kinds of things from FTX exploding and, and, and everything else. But it's really these use cases that are being built on Hedera that will drive that revenue and bring value to the network. Well, this has been an excellent update. And for anybody that's interested in following this, Brandon has weekly updates on his channel, The H Bar Bull. So go over there and take a look at it. I want to thank you, Brandon, so much for being here. Uh, and uh, do you have anything else you want to say about your channel? No, not too much. But like you said, we go through everything that's being built and the entire ecosystem. Every Friday afternoon, it comes out. So everybody's welcome to come in. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Well, it's been an honor for me too. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time. At goldsilver.com, we have a price match guarantee, free shipping, global storage options, and phenomenal customer service. 
Thanks for making GoldSilver.com your bullion dealer.